Okay. All right. We are back on. We're going to start this again. Angela Jenkins, Senior Vice President of the American National Bank of Texas, welcome to our video cast. We are delighted to have you. For the sake of our audience, would you mind sharing a little bit about your background and what you're focused on right now in your profession? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for having me and having this opportunity to speak to all of you out there. I am all things operational risk, plus probably a tad more operational risk is the risk of loss or inadequate um, things not working correctly from inadequate losses and inadequate operations, but around people, processes, systems, and external events, so PPSE. Um, I also add in a little bit of records management, which gets into your information governance. I have privacy, which definitely over overlaps into this. Um, business continuity management, third-party risk. Um, I think those are a lot of my heavy hitters outside of everything else, operational risk that's in here, but definitely work closely with data governance and information governance overall um, here at the bank. I've been at the bank for a few years, and we're a smaller community bank that's grown a, quite quickly over the past uh, three years or so, and we're starting to really implement some of these, these things to enable us to continue that growth and to manage our data and to manage our decisions all the way up to the strategic decisions of the board. Um, so, data used everywhere. Thank you, Angela. Um, this is a four-part series, so for our audience, if you're listening to this section, it is part one. And Angela, you're going to share with us some of the topics that you're passionate about and that you would like to, um, one, maybe educate our audience on, two, maybe the upcoming risk managers or risk officers in the financial services that need to be aware of these things, um, your, your thoughts about the future, uh, your best practices in your successful career. Uh, so let's go at it with topic number one. Um, so go ahead, please. Okay, my first topic, and I think one that a lot of us struggle with, is what I call um, data governance going mainstream. And what that means to some of you as you roll your eyes at me is we already have data governance at our location, at our business and our organization. But some of us aren't as quick or as fast as some of you. And some of us may be at a point where we did the initial setup, you know, we did the basics, we did a tool, we got some policies, but now we're ready to really mature and really embrace data governance. Or some of us are really starting to struggling maybe to get that first implementation or to really have the executive level or the board truly understand what data governance is and what it does for them and what the true risk of not having data governance is and what those implications may be. And that's a really, it's a really tough sell in a lot of reasons. And I hate to use the word sell, but everything is a sell, sale at this point when you want to implement. Yeah. But the reason why is because Data governance is such a complex and big topic that when people want to know, you know, on that board slide with three bullets, what does it mean? Tell me the whole story. It's hard to condense data governance to three bullet points, right? Yeah. And, um, you yeah. know, our board our board uh, members for risk governance uh, or risk management jokes about his three bullet points all the time, and I want that all in three bullet points. So he gets <laughs> it, but he, uh, he does want a condensed version. Yeah. So I think what you're really seeing, and especially um, maybe – last year and definitely trending again this year, is that there's a shift from nice to have to necessity. I mean, yes. your business doesn't stay still. We all know that, but neither does the data landscape. It's not going to wait for you. It's not going to push pause. Um, yes. So that really means that you got to change your, your model. Maybe we're shifting from, you know, a gut feel model of strategic decision making more to a data driven business model. And that's change. And change is hard. And understanding that concept is just hard. Um, yeah. yeah. Why would we need to do that? And then the whole reason is competition and growth, what we all want yeah. to achieve. We all want to achieve success. And we have to do that by leveraging and optimizing our information assets. Because if we don't, we're going to be left behind, right? Because somebody yeah. else is, and they're going to have the. We're going to have those different um, capabilities, and really to predict and analyze and put a whole bunch of information that a human just is not capable of processing all at one time, but a machine is, and it's using the that data, and it's using the right data and the cleanse data to do that. So some of the questions that I use to speak about this instead of, you know, for my three bullet points, but what I ask them to think about of data governance is what data do we have? 
What data do we need? Are we missing data that we need? How do we obtain that data on a regular basis, recurring the same way? How do we cleanse it so everybody's using the same thing? How do we sort that? And the really last question and the most important, do we trust the accuracy of our data? Because if the answer is no, we have a bigger risk and a bigger problem um, than, than we might want to admit. Um, and that's kind of hot. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I was, uh, there are so many great things that you're saying, Angela, and I'm, I'm thinking about the folks that might be under the impression if they're starting their journey in data governance more formally, especially if it's under a risk officer, they might be thinking that collecting the inventory of the data is, should not be that hard. But it well, is hard. It is very hard. It is very hard. That is one of the things that I um, do recommend, though, when you go down this path, is that you re the first step is to really take a true assessment of your data. And that you know involves the entire business and getting them to understand the concept and to understand that and to understand what is the critical data and how, what controls do we have around that and to secure that. And then once you move past that, what is your plan to build that risk culture, that data governance risk culture? And what does that involve? I mean, we're gonna have to tailor this for everything. If it was off the shelf and could be applied anywhere, we'd all do it, right? If it was easy, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So That's it's right. really about tailoring it to yourself and how do you want your business to be able to do that? And there's lots of different ways to do that. Um, I'm a smaller community bank. So I'm not a Bank of America or, or the mega banks out there. Um, so I definitely don't have all the resources that, you know, at my fingertips that they do. Um, so how do we do it for us? We still have data. We still want to achieve the same things. We still want to embrace all of those things. So how do we do it? Um, and that's really what we're trying to do is we're trying to increase those risks because without data governance, it really introduces new risks. And that's really what we're doing. I mean, you have access yeah. controls, you know, for more people having more access to different systems. You have people misinterpreting data, which is an honest mistake. You have misuse of data. That can be accidental, it could be intentional, it could be anything in between, right? Um, it, but it happens and it is a risk. And then you have the risk yeah. of making too much data available to everyone. I mean, it has to be, your access should be to the purpose, right? Yeah. You know, what you need to know and how to, and then not only what you need to know to have access, but how to use it and how to interpret it and how to put it into your everyday processes and decision making. So we would say that that's the, that's the risk side, right? That's the bad stuff that we like to, yeah. to focus on. What's the opportunity? Is that you're really creating opportunities for innovation at all levels of the business. You know, they're going to be the, your front line is going to be what can provide, you know, this is the product we need to offer. Or what if we tweak this service or tweak to this, I think we'd gain so much more. This is what I'm hearing. Look at this data that's backing up what I'm saying. So let's go do, you know, let's put a proposal out to go do something. And I think that's really what the, what the opportunity is so great. It's hard to really put it in there. But the other opportunity is you're reducing a lot of manual costs. You're, you're reducing compliance costs. Yeah. That of itself should make an executive jump for joy. So, <laughs> you would think, yes. <laughs> can't get them to do anything else. They might jump for joy for that. That's right. Um, yes. And looking at this, Angela, from a risk perspective, you're in such a special position to be able to marry governance and risk from your angle. There are some great formulas and calculations that you leverage to get to the finish line faster, right? Um, I, I'd love to hear some of that from you. So I think what you're alluding to is that you have like probability and impact, right? You have some severe, it gives you severity of the impact and then how, uh, how it may occur, maybe um, frequency or mm -hmm. maybe number of years, if you will. It could be six months out, it could be three years out. Um, when it might, you know, that, or does it happen repeatedly, or is it a one-time, one-off event? Um, you know, being from Texas, we don't normally have major earthquakes or mudslides or things like that right now, um, hopefully not ever, but, you know, that would be a way out there event as opposed to something else that could happen any day or many times a day. And you really have to look at that probability and impact, and that's really going to drive where your focus is. 
um, I recently had a conversation with someone about, you know, how we get all of this data. Let's take an inventory and see where we're at. What do we do there? What do we know it to work on? And that's my answer to them is what is the most critical items in your area that you feel don't have controls on them, that we, we don't have that, you know, you can have a really high inherent risk for just doing business and having that data, but if you have the right controls in place, like data governance, frameworks, and policies, then that residual leftover risk is low and probably not an area you want to focus on. Um, and so you really want a method to be able to do that, and that's usually the way we do that. We go in there and we say, what are the underlying risks of what could go wrong. There's many tools out there that you can use to do this. Um, I use a FAMICA, there's a lot of other ones. There's surveys, there's questionnaires, there's lots of different ways you could do maps of your processing maps to get there. Lots of different failure modes that you could do. But what could go wrong? And then are there controls in place to do so? And if they're not, how bad? What is the worst thing that could happen? How bad is this? And that, right? rank them, rack and stack them, see where they fall, you know, map them out visually and see where that is. Um, the conversation I had about someone was, you know, what do we call what we call master data and um, transactional data, no reference data, sorry, I'm mixing, mixing things, but what master <laughs> data and reference data might be your two key components and where those are and where those controls lie might, might be where you focus. And the reason why I say that is because you want those two to be in sync because that's where your most um, reporting and your most transactions are taking place is with the use of those data. So you want that to be accurate, cleansed, available to the right people. All of those components that make out your framework. Yeah, and, and this is, um, how does that get explained to the board or to individuals that are looking at the organization purely from an operational, perhaps, or strategic or financial perspective, how do we articulate that effectively, as you are managing right now to do so well, in, in, in a way that we don't lose the fact that this is governance, after all, and it may not sound as glamorous, but it can be an accelerator for everything else that needs to be done. I think that really the, the message that I say to them is that when you look at a report, how confident are you in that report? Um, and the underlying data. You might be fine with the system that's generating the report or the model that's using the report. That's a whole different risk of itself, by the way. But you might feel comfortable with that. But if you're not confident that we're pulling the right data, then that in and of itself tells you that we have a problem. The other thing I would say is, you know, something is going to go wrong at some point in the time if we don't put these controls in place. And the organization is going to have unexpected business ramifications. And really, that's their risk appetite. That's what the board's putting on there. They pull in those levers, and they move them up and forward and left and right. And they're making overall strategic decisions on how much risk they want to take, um, whether it's a new product offering, going after new customers, going to new service areas, whatever those might be. This is one of those strategic levers that they're pulling, and they're saying how much risk they want to take. And when you really put it into those perspectives and those tolerance levels and what that really opens them up to um, outside of just, you know, regulatory or compliance things, which, you know, will get you a lot of attention as well, but, you know, <laughs> what's the risk of bad decisions? Yeah. I mean, that's really what it comes down to and how tolerant do they want to be to have that risk of bad decisions. I think that's yeah. that's really it is. And the offset of that is how tolerant are you to enhancing the capabilities of the business to take advantage of more opportunities. And I don't think yeah. you can really put data and metrics in front of them because you don't you may not be able to. Some of us are more advanced and, and we can, and that's why you're rolling your eyes at me. But some of us may not be there yet, and we're still yeah. trying to show that progress. So there's definitely some ways to do that, um, that doesn't, I mean, I was just, I definitely would focus on the strategic component. How do you know that you're going in the right direction? And yeah. how much risk are you willing to absorb going down this path? 
because I think it's inevitable, honestly, um, whether it's how competitive you remain or something bad happening or not being compliant or a whole plethora of other outside forces coming in on you. It's really that risk discussion is what we're really talking about. And Angela, even at that level, would you say there is um, a change component, uh, operational change management, or what does that look like? And change management and gen in general, I think, is a very interesting topic just because change management, you usually see it in technology, just in normal, you know, technology applications, that's where you're going to have the most mechanisms in place for that, whether it's um, software applications or something else, something like websites. But a lot of things we don't have change management over is really over our data um, and structured data. And I know I mentioned that just a, min a minute ago, but it really goes back to the importance of master data and reference data and all of those data, but really are going to keep it in sync and you don't want it to go out of sync. So you could have some examples of change management. So changes in your data models, um, your definitions, your structure of metadata, uh, you know, repositories all by itself is huge. Stewardship responsibilities is a huge one, I think, as well. Um, and that's mm -hmm. just a few. That's There's a big one. Yeah. yeah. Yes, that's their whole culture right there. Um, <laughs> that's going to really yes. you know, absor absorb that change, hopefully, for you and really give, make the most impact and see the most results that way. Because as I like to say, is if people start re repeating or understanding my Angela-isms as I explain to them operational risk or record management or any of those projects, then I feel like I've actually have success because they're actually, there's a nugget and there's a light bulb moment that's in there and they may not know the answer fully, but they know that there's yeah. a light bulb moment and they understand that there's a topic and they know there's a resource they can go ask yes. and get some help. And I think that, that in and of itself is a huge pull for change. Even though that's small and that may not be the end goal, it's, it's really huge to start getting those changes in that respect. So let me ride that wave of Angela-isms for a moment. <laughs> You've got the, the president or the CEO of an organization or a board member in the elevator with you for a couple of minutes, and you've got that opportunity to really anchor in the depth of importance of this. What would you tell them? And well, since I'm a bank, you have to keep in mind that I'm going to leverage all of those components because that's what my business is. But the, I would say then that, you know, even if you're, you're – feel like you're confident and you like your gut feel approach to uh, making business decisions, It's this is tied to so many other regulatory and data and, um, sorry, data statutory and regulatory kind of composition. This whole um, culture or environment that's going on outside of us, landscape would probably be the word I was looking for, um, but it's particularly important because it involves those of stress testing, CCAR and Dodd-Frank, and Dodd-Frank keeps growing. We all know they keep amending and changing to it. Um, data privacy, just data privacy in and of itself should make you want to, you know, shudder a little bit, but GLBA updates, you know, the data privacy laws from, from states like CCPA or C PRA or GDPR, and even more importantly and foundational to the business is BSA and AML, um, you know, anti-money laundering and being able to know your customer, CIP or KYC, those data regulations that are huge are so reliant on our um, data to do that. And finally, now that we're all... Um, CECL went into effect for uh, your allowance account for loans, and that's basically, or bad loans, um, and basically that applies to every bank now. It's not just the big bank this year, it's every bank. So you've just touched on every major facet of this yeah. bank and every yes. major regulatory um, area that's under major scrutiny right now with one topic. The same data feeds all of these things. And that's what I would drive home. That's what I that's would drive home. <laughs> I would be convinced. If I'm in the elevator with you and I didn't know the topic, I'd say, okay, I'm listening now. <laughs> yes. I mean, I like it, but I'm going to listen now. Yes. <laughs> and that's really what it's true. I mean, there's simple facts to describe this landscape as well. Um, I know I'm going to bore you with facts and figures, but I'm a, I'm a one plus one equals two kind of person. But, you know, 
The National Conference of State Legislatures said at least 40 U.S. states and Puerto Rico in 2022 um, reviewed more than 250 bills or resolutions involving cybersecurity, and 24 states enacted at least 41 bills. On the flip side, at least 35 states and the District of Columbia in 2022 reviewed almost 200 consumer privacy bills. Those two in and of itself, yeah. it's mind-blowing, right? Yeah. It's so much yeah. change. It's velocity and volume of change that's occurring in this environment. Yeah. And without the framework, it's a huge risk. Huge. It is. It and is. In yeah. and of itself, are hard enough to keep up with <laughs> without having to worry about the integrity of your data. Yeah. Do you see it as an advantage to have data governance uh, report to risk or outside of risk, or what is your take on that? I think data governance, there's a benefit. I think it's a benefit based on your business, right? We all have to tailor to our strengths of our business and where we like things to be and, and where all of our resources that, that know and understand these concepts are. So first and foremost, I would say it's definitely based on tailoring to your individual business. Um, secondly, I would say that um, having it under risk management is a really great area because you understand the risk of not having it. You understand the thresholds and the levers that you want to pull and you can put it into those risk and opportunity kind of format. Um, that being said, if you put it under, say, um, an information technology or an infor you know some sort of information security IT type of realm, it's not usually under information security in our area, but it's under the general IT area, it's fine as well because they do have a close link into operational risk because they roll up under me. It's one of those important components mm -hmm. under operational risk. So they do get the risk guidance with that, but they also get some of the leverage of being IT based, right? It could go um, both ways with advantages and there's a little bit of overlap with both of those. So you're going to have um, IT people who kind of get hip on the risk lingo, and you're going to have risk people who get hip on the IT lingo, and it can be a perfect marriage in a lot of different ways. In any case, you both have to work together to be successful. I would definitely say there has to be strong communication because it is a framework. We're talking about governance. We're talking yes. about controls and risks. So it definitely is a linkage, and there definitely is a marriage to be had there. Angela, on this topic, any summary or ribbon that you'd like to place around the conversation as a takeaway, as the most important takeaway for our audience? I think that data trends are into stepping stones for success, I think is the biggest thing. And I think the biggest thing you can do is tailor to your organization so that you can check and adjust to situations as they occur and as things happen in real time. Because if it was something that we could all just plug and play, we would already do it, right? And it's yeah. not. So don't try to be like your competitor bank for me across the street. Don't try to be like them. Try to be like you and tailor it to your strengths and weaknesses. The second one is data stewards. Or just data um, literacy in general. If you don't have stewards, that's fine. Figure it out because they're the ones that uh, is where the data governance comes to play and it comes in play inside your company. You get to define it. You get to use yeah. your people. Yeah. It's free to use your people, right? Yeah. So definitely use those insights. And then um, just know that this is really a signal of structural and permanent change and how we're going to evolve. Um, and the reason why I say that is that the more concepts around data um, legislation and different capabilities that are going on, there's going to be less gut instinct and more data-driven decisions. And you're going to see this evolve more in laws and regulations and best practices. And it's going to start changing as, as the environment changes. We're going to want to change with it. Um, I definitely don't feel like it's going to go away as much as it's going to move to the forefront. So laying these, these groundwork and these stepping stones or the foundation to a building, whatever your reference is, that's really where you want to be. And you really want to focus on the strengths of your particular business to be able to do it. And I think that when you start finding those allies and those champions, um, maybe, you know, for example, for me, um, you might not think accounting would be a really great champion. Maybe you would. But there's people over there that are really IT savvy and want to 
grab that data and make all these great reports. And you know what? Having them on your side and speaking your lingo is your best ally because they're going to speak to others that want the data too. And then it just continues to grow and grow and grow. But you're using your inside resources and your inside bank um, processes to achieve that. And that's the greatness that rolls up. I think you have articulated in a fantastic way the opportunity, the uh, um, ability for every organization of any size to really um, take a hold of this and master it, uh, slowly but surely, depending on the pace that allows them to do so. And you've also laid out the um, strategy as well as activities for folks to learn from if this has not been their space before. Mm -hmm. um, I commend you for embracing it so much from a risk perspective that can be an accelerator. I could not have said it any better than you, so it's, I'm just encouraged to know what's going to happen at the bank uh, as you continue to guide and lead these efforts through the operational risk lens because um, that is a perfect spot with your leadership to uh, see it grow. Um, so for our audience, this is the end of the part one. Uh, more topics to come from Ms. Angela Jenkins, Senior Vice President of the American National Bank of Texas, and so well versed in so many areas, uh, leading the operational risk management at the moment, as well as many other functions. But more on that as we uh, migrate to the next topic. Stay tuned. Mm -hmm.